Hey friends, Josh here, punchingsideways.com. Today we're talking with Seamus Evans, really funny and fun guy to be around. You can hear Seamus on the radio, on the podcast of his radio show, etc. All that will be linked up below where you're listening to this. He's a really fascinating guy. I hadn't met Seamus before. As I mentioned in the interview, he's as nice and as funny a person as my friend Jake told me that he would be. And I guess it doesn't really feel like an exhaustive breakdown of who Seamus is. It feels like, yeah, I might have made a new podcasty, radio-y, creative-y kind of friend. So Seamus, he is with me. And we're sitting in a room I actually haven't podcasted in before. But first time. First time, yeah. It's we're, fit- we're popping your room cherry. Yes, a bit of, <laughs> a bit of room cherry. It's actually not sounding not too bad. I thought it was going to be an echo chamber, but... that might, good. Yeah, it might be this broken headphone that's it's only in mono. Yeah, yeah, I'm hearing that too, but I mean, what are you going to do? Yeah, and I'm trying a new piece of gear too, so that's all great. So, mate, I just wanted to jump straight in. There was an article recently, and as I explained to Seamus before today's interview... I like to go reverse chronologically, so just want to tell us a little bit about what that was about, where that came from, and then we'll move forward. And Yeah. Yep. So for many years, I've struggled with uh, alcohol. I'm a very big binge drinker, huge binge drinker, and it's always been really uncomfortable because I won't drink during the week, but as soon as it comes Friday afternoon, I'll be drunk from you know Friday afternoon till the wee hours of Sunday morning. And yeah, it's been for a very long time I've wanted to give up alcohol, but I've found it hard because there's always something on. I've got a very big friendship group and a lot of friends and, and you know, what do you do when you're, you're in your 20s in Australia? Mate, you go to the pub with the boys. That's that's what you do. Yeah. 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 So it it's there's no real time to stop. I've always found... I was like, I'll stop next weekend. Oh, no, that's someone's birthday. I'll stop next weekend. Oh, that's the after work (laughs) Christmas drinks or whatever. And then I found it was becoming a really destructive pattern where I was really binging to the excess after the night. So the party's over, I'm at home, I'm out the back and I'm chain smoking and I'm I'm, uh, I'm finishing bottles of vodka and, and then looking for beer and then wine. And I hate smoking, but when I'm drunk, don't have the willpower not to yeah (laughs) and so yeah i'll be sitting on my back deck five in the morning it's dark it's lonely it's cold playing uh uh, music off my iphone speaker and i have done that too many times and it affects me during the week it affects my work it affects my emotional levels my energy levels my anxiety my stress and so finally at 27 and a bit i'm almost i'm 28 in august i thought you know what i'm gonna just cut it I'm going to cut it out. Ideally, I would like to be forever, but, you know, I'd, I think it's foolish to say never do, like that's it, never again. So at Christmas, I'll revisit and, and see if I want to continue being sober or see if I want to try a drink to see if I can I can reduce the amount. I uh, And I don't go into those binging habits because I do like the taste of a good rosé. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's like me with Jamison. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess... It might have seemed like a bit of a strange place to start today and for anyone who's listening that is familiar with Seamus probably thinks it's just rehashing something you've already spoken about. (laughs) But I guess two things. One, you did actually, and it was quite mature the way you handled it, your job, from what I can gather, and we'll maybe talk about a little bit how that operates, you're literally living with a lack of sleep-induced jet lag already. And yeah. it was being accentuated by heavy drinking that was lasting multiple days into the week. So oh. if you want to tell us about what you do day to day, it might give people some context. Yeah. yeah. So I'm a breakfast radio host here in Albury, Albury Wodonga on the Borders Hit 104.9. And yeah, I've got to get up at, you know, anywhere between quarter to four to half past four. And when you're getting up that early, it, you're very tired all the time and you're always lacking sleep. And when you're lacking sleep... Your emotions play up, your stress levels are higher, and when you're chained to uh, you know a studio with with one other person, even though I love Riley, you know sometimes we can be in each other's pockets. And then if you add hungover on top of that, 
And then, you know, you think, oh, well, I'm, I'm going to go get a pizza tonight instead. I couldn't be stuffed and watch a movie. It's just this really vicious cycle of a negative mindset. And I just needed to break it because it was just building up. And I was like, I've had enough of this. And this has been building up for years, mind you. And I remember thinking, if I want to be able to perform at work, you've got to do a three-hour show every morning, first thing in the morning. You've got to be sharp. You've got to be alert. You've got to be thinking five moves ahead. You just can't do that after, you know, a binge session for two days for, you know, 48 hours. You just can't do it. It just yeah, yeah. affects me too much. Yeah. And that's, that's awesome and that's kind of what I thought might have been the story there. But also, and this is the second thing I wanted to ask, is there an expectation because of the job you're in and I've become recently fascinated with radio in certain ways and more so the talent and the pressure that it puts on talent, how you're really expected to ingratiate yourself to the nth degree with the local community that you're working in, it, it must be hard to avoid even more opportunities to be around people drinking and partying, etc. Because yeah. part of the job is to be around that. Yeah. To be honest, I, I, I don't have a problem being around people who are drinking or who are drinking. If people just like I've I've done sessions where I've not drunk before, I've gone stints with not drinking. But this is the time I want to do it for a very long period of time, not just an intermittent stint. So it doesn't affect me if people are drunk. I think they're annoying and I can't I don't deal with them and I leave. But I can handle drunk people. That doesn't necessarily affect me. It is difficult though on the pressure part of things. Let's just have you seen Space Jam? Yeah, it's one of my favorite comedies, yeah. Okay. So, you know the scene where they're doing the deal with Michael Jordan and they say if you lose this game, we win and I take you, Michael, to my theme park and I chain you to a desk and you've got to play against people and you've got to sign autographs. And it's essentially, if you've got a personality, okay, you think you're funny, okay, let's put you in a desk next to a microphone, we chain you to that for three hours and you perform day in, yeah. day out. It's essentially what it is. It sounds horrible, but I'm choosing to be there. Yeah. Because it's fun and it's amazing. But... That's I've thought that so often. I'm like, man, I am literally selling my personality. Yeah. <laughs> like, like people yeah. are making money of my personality, so I can keep people listening to the radio, so ads can play and people can get paid. Yeah, <laughs> and that's probably not as enjoyable an experience as it could be without the three day hangovers involved. Yeah, ex exactly. The hangovers make it worse. However, in saying that, I have chosen that because. You can look at it that way like, oh, I'm selling my soul or I'm being paid to be Seamus. I'm not like an engineer or a builder who I've acquired a skill. I am literally being paid to be me. And that to me is like the best opportunity ever because I am just me. Yeah, it sounds pretty cool. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, Yeah, it's awesome. So we won't linger on the article too much because right. there's only there's a point where Seamus will get to where he's probably going to be sick of talking about it <laughs> and I don't want to be responsible for that. <laughs> so we'll move on and we might just go now right back and I know you as someone who has moved around mm -hmm. and part of what we were trying to tap into on this particular show to make it a little bit different is to talk about the unique interesting things that you found in different places mm. that you've been doing creative work that you might think feed into why that certain place led to that certain thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess if we go right back, the earliest record <laughs> that I could find of Seamus was as part of a show I'd never heard of because I'm too old <laughs> called Toasted TV. Yes. Which I think is the successor to Cheese TV. Correct. Which I did see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Cheese TV finished and then a couple of years later Toasted TV started and I wasn't in it. I got the job on Toasted TV in Channel 10 in Brisbane, uh, March 2009. That was my 30th of March 2009. I remember signing the contract. Bang. And yeah, that was my first ever proper real job. After high school, I studied acting at a TAFE because my end of school uh, result was horrible because I did very poorly in school. And it was interesting when I, I went into acting because I wanted to be on TV. And I remember watching Dave Chappelle's stand up and it said, if you want to do anything performing-wise, like stand-up or you've got to have some sort of acting ability. 
So I didn't know where to start. So I went into acting and I had an agent and I got an audition for Toasted and ended up getting it at 18, which is really lucky. Like that's really lucky. Yeah. To get a tel- national TV job at nine, at 18. Like I, I was really blown away. Yeah. Australia is not so obsessed with the youth angle as some other countries yeah it's more about experience so the same people get the same jobs exactly. a lot of the time exactly yeah. and to be honest that was one of the reasons why i left tv because i was pigeonholed big time so i was on toasted tv for four years that was awesome that was one of the funnest times of my life it was a great team we did we just mucked around anything we thought was fun we would do it i traveled australia i traveled to america new zealand I hosted shows out of theme parks, out of Dream World, Movie World, Sea World, Went Wild. Yeah. Like, oh, it was just so fun. And then uh, four years went by, and this is where my partying really started as well at Toasted. Okay. Anyway. Sorry, sorry, Seamus. Can you just tell me what mm. audience was that show aimed at? Uh, that was aimed at uh, six to 14 year olds. Yeah, right. Yeah. So obviously the partying was happening off camera. <laughs> yeah, big time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and that was a group wide party, do you think? Or was it a little crew that grew into a bigger group? How did that part of it work? Well, no, I just, that's when I started partying with my friends. And you know what, man? Leading back to that article, this is how bad I was. I used to go out on my own. And I remember once I went out five days straight like it was a five-day bender on my own and uh yeah that was that was really bad i had to start raining it in then but that was one of the reasons why i left brisbane because i was like again i was over that behavior and and i was over the tv show which was really sad but it wasn't i wasn't going anywhere i wasn't developing and i'm someone who i can't just sit still in one position for too long i get really bored if i don't develop and if i don't learn if i don't grow so i was like okay that's it i'm gonna quit and then I said to my boss, I said, all right, I'm, I'm going to leave. I'm going to go down and try radio in Nova in, in Sydney. And they said, what about Totally Wild in Adelaide? And I thought, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a recognisable brand across exactly. so many age groups. Yeah. <laughs> they offered me a pay rise and I thought, I just want to get out of Brisbane. I want something new. I was 20, 23 to the day when I left Brisbane I drove to Adelaide. Sorry, can we just focus, yeah. just talk a little bit about Brisbane? We'll get back yeah. to Adelaide. Yeah. I just don't want to skip over Brisbane because yeah. we do want to talk about the places you've been. Yeah. I'm assuming that's where you grew up from the vibe yeah. I'm 23 picking day, up. 23 years to the day in the same house. Yeah. And just so people know, I pretty much know Seamus in sound bites up until this point tonight. But he's <laughs> yeah. as nice a person as my friend Jake has told me he is. So that's been pleasant. So 23 years in Brisbane. Yeah. What do people that aren't from Brisbane not give Brisbane credit for? Because I know, at least in the radio world, it's this monolithic creative mecca. Yeah. So I'm I'm assuming it's not just in radio that it's like that. Mm, No way. Brisbane, I hated Brisbane when I left because I think everyone goes through this thing where when you grow up, you hate where you're from and you want to change and you want to move away and, oh, this place sucks. Brisbane, I look at Brisbane now and... it, I think it deserves credit for its maturity because in the last, mm, I think I've been away now there for uh, five years, I think, six years, it has changed so much and it is a really cool place. South Bank is really great. The atmosphere, the vibe, the culture that it's developing. Brisbane used to be a really small town and it just went boom and all of a sudden there was a there was a lot of people there. So small town mentality type town. Sorry, yeah, yeah. small town mentality and yeah. then, you know, like things like, Nothing was ever open past five, ever. <laughs> and then I left and everything started to get cool. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, man, I miss Brisbane. Brisbane, a lot of production comes out of Brisbane in TV, in, in, in uh, so much film, so many ads. Like as a creative hub, yeah, that place is booming with talent. Yeah, I know that even in the music scene. Yeah. I mean, I've always been in progressive rock bands. Mm. The Butterfly Effect and Dead Letter Circus mm-hmm. and a lot of the bands that those bands spawned pretty much other than Cog they were all from Brisbane yeah so even in alternative music they've had this massive footprint now across 20 years of Australian music yeah it's just crazy really isn't it <laughs> yeah it's a it's a it's just a really cool place and um 
Is there a reason why as a Brisbaneite, I'm assuming that's what it is? Mm. It, if it's not, you can tell me to F off there. A Brisbaneite? What do you mean? A Brisbaneite, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just thought I'd throw it out there. Oh, no, I, th- I don't know why that's the nickname. I like, uh, there's Bris Vegas and Bris yeah. Rail. <laughs> <laughs> right My dad calls it Bris Rail. Yeah, right. <laughs> we'll it. stick away from that. <laughs> the What is it, do you think about Brisbane that's, because obviously it's quite a bit smaller than Brisbane, oh, sorry, Melbourne and Sydney. Yeah. The funny thing about Brisbane, they try and be Sydney or Melbourne. They're trying. Well, when I was there, everything in Brisbane and everyone in Brisbane was trying, were looking up to Sydney like it was a bigger brother. And they were just failing miserably at being Sydney and Melbourne. So they were just this shitty version of those cities. Yeah. <laughs> but I think this is what I mean now. I think they're coming into their, it's coming into its own now and it's becoming Brisbane, which is really appealing. That could just be my um, my age and the fact that I've still got my family and friends there. Okay, so we now have established that Brisbane was pretty kick-ass when it comes to creative stuff. Yeah. So you found your way to Adelaide and you said you drove there. I drove there. Had that, it took was, me two days. Was that the biggest drive you'd ever undertaken? Or was there? Yeah. were you doing much actual physical climbing, jumping, et cetera, et cetera, through Cheese TV or was that to, more? Through Toasted TV. Oh, sorry. No, that's yeah, right. Toasted. I... Um, I was doing a lot of driving. We took a caravan, a motorhome around Australia for Toaster TV over, I think it was 14 weeks. Yeah, I did a lot of driving there. So that was just what, yourself, someone else and a bag of chips? Or? <laughs> it was me, Kel, my co-host, David Robinson, my boss at the time, a cameraman and a soundo. And Sorry, was David, was he all of those things? Like the three others? <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, the, we actually had a cameraman and a soundo. It was a really... It's really freaking good production, I tell you what. Yeah, nice. But I'll, I'll dig some up and try, I'll put it in the show notes of this episode if I can find some. Yeah, it's all over YouTube. Yeah, that was a really fun time. We had so much fun on that show, man. That was cool. What was the be- Before we get to Adelaide, what was the best, the town that sticks out the most in your memory from the road trip in the motorhome? Oh, that is such a good question. It doesn't have to be a town. It could be an event. Remember, I was a really big party animal, so a lot of it is a blur. <laughs> but like and the funny thing is with all these small towns in Australia they all look the same like yeah. they're flat they're red <laughs> and there's dirt in them <laughs> with you know populations of 150 yeah believe the hype people Australia is quite yeah. often red and dirty Chinchilla was cool King Arroy was cool I went to a place called Forbes in New South Wales and there was a really cool like gargoyle mansion randomly in the middle of nowhere oh man that's such a hard question we can come back to that. We'll have to come about. back. Yeah. You're going to you're gonna have to leave. I don't want to derail you too much. Yeah. <laughs> so that drive to Adelaide, that was a solo drive? Yeah, that was a solo drive. And I, um, oh man, I really needed that drive because I just finished a month in Europe with five mates and that was a non-stop <laughs> party. That was loose. And I needed to have a lot of uh, self-reflection. And so I took two days and I drove... 12 hours a day and yeah I stopped off in Dubbo and I drove by myself and I listened to music I listened to uh ABC National which was awesome like the country hour yeah that sort of stuff yeah yeah like a lot of talk back and whatnot and that drive man that was really cool it was the first time I've ever really seen emus cross the road usually it's like just kangaroos going through Dubbo was really interesting yeah, that was a really that was a really good drive because by the end of it, I went from at the beginning, I went to this really manic mindset of being in Europe and and leaving that uh, life behind a little bit, and then by the end, I got to Adelaide and um, yeah, it was like I like I had a really big shower. Two days on your own in a car, <laughs> you cleanse your thoughts. <laughs> yeah, I bet you did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's good. So, what were you actually heading to in Adelaide? I mean, obviously there was the job, but. Did you have a place or was that something you had to figure out? Yeah, no, I had nothing. I knew one guy. He said, yeah, mate, you can stay with me. A week before I got there, he called me and said, mate, I'm sorry, but I've got a job somewhere else. I'm going to be moving to Sydney. <laughs> I said, oh, okay, no no worries. Like, that's totally fine. Yeah. Sorry, were you in still in Europe at this point? Uh, yeah, yeah, I yeah, was. No worries, mate. <laughs> cool, whatever. Sydney's cool. Enjoy. Yeah, enjoy, man. <laughs> I'm too busy yeah. flirting with the hot Europeans. So... I, yeah, I couch surfed for a little while for like about a month. I couch surfed until I found this old crummy place that was over 100 years old in Adelaide, right in the city off Hutt Street. 
and it was cold. There were cracks in the wall so big that I could see outside. Jesus. Like this place sucked, man. I didn't have a bed. <laughs> I didn't have a bed in Adelaide. The whole time I lived in Adelaide, I only had a mattress, <laughs> well. which I got from some guy. Man, I yeah, I was I was a bit of a bum. I ended up selling my car and walking everywhere, and uh, and yeah, that <laughs> I ended up. I had a ghost in that house in Adelaide in the in, in the, the crack house, crack house. Yeah. yeah, and oh man, that was a crazy house too. That was just that was gross. So police what? busted in, and yeah. my housemate was dealing drugs, and I didn't know about it. So the police just busted in and arrested him. And oh man, it was a loose house. Just a complete sort of tangent. Do the police actually have to force their way into a house where you can walk through the walls, or did they just pop in? <laughs> yeah, they just pop in. Hey, mate, the side. Yeah. let me tell you a story about your housemate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so what time of the year was it just so we get some context? Because obviously Adelaide could be quite pleasant for six months of the year and then other times it could yeah. be brutally hot or cold. So I arrived, I arrived, I think it was the 10th. I think it might have been the 10th or the uh, 9th. And my first day... Of what month, sorry? Sorry, August. Of August, of so August. still cold. Yep. Yeah, freezing, man. Coming from Brisbane, it was freezing. My first day on Totally Wild of the new job was... Oh, no, sorry. The next year to the day, that's when Robin Williams killed himself. The year anniversary of when I started on Totally Wild, yeah. Wonderful. I know. What a sad, (laughs) sombre note. (laughs) So Totally Wild, we'll move on. Yeah. That obviously was a pretty big experience to establish you in, I'm assuming even outside of television. Uh, Was that? uh, Yeah. Would you have called that? Was that like an inflection point career-wise for you or was it just a Big step, time. Yeah. It was a stepping stone. It was also trying to add another string to my bow because all I had was toasted TV where I was just mucking around and I knew how to entertain. But Totally Wild taught me how to tell a story. It taught me how to communicate and it was just me. I didn't. I couldn't rely on a co-host because I was the solo reporter. And that was really where I learned television production and script writing and producing and reporting like actually telling a story using visual medium, uh, using, you know, the power of uh, great script writing and, and language and and sound bites and, and interviews. And that was really interesting. I, I really took an interest to that. That yeah. was cool. So that stuff, you said that it taught you those things, but you also were doing it by yourself. So how much was that you just learning on the job? So much of it. Yeah. I was, yeah, it was... I had a really cool mentor uh, as a boss for a period of time and a couple of people, a couple of producers above me who are still really close friends of mine to this day. And they really guided me along the script writing and how to to tell a story, um, which was really good. But by the end of it, because I was there for two and a half, I think almost three years, by the end of it, I wasn't writing stories. It was so cool. That was the easiest job for me, which is why I left because it was too easy. It was boring. I would turn up. Sometimes I wouldn't even turn up to work. But when I had a shoot day, I would turn up with the camera crew, no script, nothing, and would just improvise the whole thing. And I would already have it mapped out in my head and knew exactly how it was going to go, And I'd, which was great because I was able to go on the fly. Just for people that aren't familiar with Totally Wild, because I'm, even though I'm obviously out of the demographic, mm, mm. I'd, I'd seen multiple episodes. Mm. What type of stuff did you cover? Man. <sighs> and how were you able to go complete impro like <laughs> well okay let's just really quickly sum up totally wild totally wild sounds great it sounds exciting when you're a kid you watch it it was so cool. i looked it up on google and i couldn't fucking believe how exciting it sounded today <laughs> i was yeah. like wow <laughs> that's impressive so <laughs> totally wild is 27 this year it's 27 years Whoa. old right in Jeez. that time it has done everything about 20 times. Every story you can think of, it's done it. Mate, I have done the most boring stories of my life. <laughs> and then I've also done stories on catching brown snakes and, you know, skydiving and diving with sharks. I've done cool stuff and I've done really boring stuff. This is totally wild. So really quickly, Channel 10 legally, every channel, they have to make a certain amount of hours of uh, C-class television. And C-class is an educational or it's it's non... No, it's not educational. It's you can't advertise during it. It's a legal requirement. So they don't put much money in it because you can't advertise in it and it's a commercial station. Fair enough. So they put it on all year round and it's 
they have to cut so many corners because they don't have a very big budget. So you have to just try and make great stuff out of no budget and no resources. Yeah, well. <laughs> but that's where a lot of the skills that I learned came into play because you're able to turn a crap subject into a really exciting story. Yeah, nice. And I'm not sure how the American system works, but I know that there was a period where there was going to be some kind of relaxation on the amount of news that you had to carry. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those stations were actually instead required to have whatever their equivalent is of C-class programming as well. So basically programming you couldn't advertise against. Yeah. Which we all know now, obviously, that the news itself half the time is an ad. So obviously that's changed. Well, that's the thing, man. With commercial TV and commercial radio, they'll always find a way to make money. And uh, the annoying thing is is people hate it for that. Like, I don't like how many ads. It's like, well... That's what it is. It's a commercial station. It's actually in the name. Exactly. They they say that they advertise their own product on the product and they call it commercial radio. (laughs) And not only that, it helps so many local business owners. Exactly. So it kind of, when people have a go at commercial stuff, I'm like, man, one, don't watch it or don't listen. And two, that's what it is, mate. It's like like going to watch a movie and then knowing what the movie is and ragging on it the whole time. It's like, mate, we all know it's a documentary about World War II. If you don't like it, don't watch it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the Tesla probably isn't going to come up in 1945. Yeah. <laughs> I know you're really excited about your Tesla. We'll get we'll get back on track. So I'm sorry I derailed us. I'm sorry. The totally wild though, is it still a pure product? Obviously, I'm assuming now it would have some advertising around it. No, no, still- no you can't. You, you're not allowed to advertise in it legally. Right. So... Yep, it's still very pure. They're still doing the same stories, yeah. just slightly differently. That's yeah. In so, one year, you would do every story, right? And then I remember I'd go, "Geez, what are we going to do next week?" And so I'd just go through last year's script yeah. and then change it. So is that a requirement of repackaging existing stuff, or do you have to go and refilm the same stories? And well, there's like a huge bank of like yeah, I was thinking 27 years, That'd like be weeks worth. Weeks. If you put it in one timeline it would be years almost like it would be so long their library has everything in it every animal you can think of and every vision of everything so we did a lot of stories without even going like just say i did a story on pigs i would do a story without even filming a pig because we just had so much vision of pigs i just research pigs to the nth degree this is why I love that job so much. I was paid to sit in front of a computer and research cool stuff. Like some of the random facts that I found, for example, hyenas, right? If you look at a hyena and a, uh, like, a, like a pack of hyenas or whatever, the women have elongated clitoris and they're bigger than the males. So if to the untrained eye, that's a dude. It's like, oh, look at the penis and they're bigger. But that's actually a woman. Like some of the we- the crazy stuff that happens in the animal kingdom. Okay, let's let's really dig down on that. <laughs> yeah. How, given the demo for that particular yeah. show, can you present a story <laughs> that's about genitalia? Like, <laughs> can I just hear about the process that you yeah. went through to make that palatable? Yeah. What you? Oh, so you what didn't you have parents it? going, "Oh my god." <laughs> no. I, well, you'd either make a joke, and like sometimes I'd say things like, "You know, when a mummy hyena and a daddy hyena." Uh, whatever i can't remember the language i used to use but you'd use things like mating and incubation period and as soon as you use the correct terminology it's not rude right so you're not sh- sharing a bone over dinner yeah not that sort of stuff no, <laughs> no. so yeah correct terminology scientifically verified words exactly yeah, yeah. that's yeah. the only way you could do it because some of the some of the producers we used to have man was so straight down the line and it's like dude that's funny for a kid yeah. Crack a joke about them having sex, but they were just so anal about it sometimes. It was a little boring. Right, I say. Obviously, you learnt a lot of skills. Yeah. And we'll move forward now a little bit in time to more so what you're doing now. Mm-hmm. As I mentioned, I've become fascinated in radio, but more mm-hmm. about the people that are on radio. Mm-hmm. And we'll actually share a kinship in that we both listen to Game Changers Radio, yeah. which is probably... It's probably in my top 10 podcasts and I've got 120 shows in my... Really? That I... I mean, I don't listen to all of them every yeah, week, yeah, but yeah, yeah. every second I'm not doing something, mm-hmm. I've usually got one in my ears. And I think we have a mutual love of Marty Shegold. Yeah, he's unreal. He's one of the reasons why I got into radio. He was in Brisbane. He was doing Brisbane Breakfast 
when I was on Toasted TV and I would drive from my house up Mount Cutha and it would take half an hour on a good day, an hour on a bad. And I would listen to Nova Breakfast and, geez, man, they used to make me laugh and Marty Shigo was just so good. And then they went into the afternoons and I'd hear him on the way back. And then, um, and yeah, he's one of the reasons why I really took a lot of big interest into radio. It just, I guess, it made me more interested in the types of people that were on radio because, mm. as you said before, commercial radio is a product of a certain type. 98% of the time it's going to be of a certain style. Yeah. And within a certain formatics. Mm-hmm. And maybe Sheer Gold, his shows probably are the ones that sit outside that. Big time. Yeah, so... Not to disparage anyone else around here who's doing radio, but I, I've listened to a lot in the last 12 months and I think you're probably the cream of the local talent. Really? Do you think that that is because you've got maybe a different skill set as far as a background? Oh, man, I'm not sure. It was really hard going from TV to radio because I could do Totally Wild and write a kid's story backwards, blindfolded. It was that easy. But... Learning how to share things about yourself on a platform with a microphone with a large audience, you don't know who's listening, your biggest challenge is your own head. And so the amount of times I would be in the middle of a talk break and I'm thinking, don't say that because this person, and they're a made up person in my head, that person's going to get offended, they're going to hate you. And then you tell yourself, oh, you should go that way because this person over there, who again, another made up character, they are going to laugh. And so constantly you're conflicted. And that was my biggest issue as I didn't know how to back myself. And it took a very long time. I still don't know how to back myself, but it took a very long time to get out of that initial fear period. And it's kind of like, kind of like a kid in the baby end of the shallow end of the pool, you know, waiting there's to ankle deep, like <laughs> I'm going to jump in. I can't jump in. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that was, um, that was actually really, really difficult. It was a very difficult start and, to radio, to be honest. This, the hit job. Yeah. Was that your first radio job? My first. Was there, what, what happened in between Totally Wild so and Radio? So I decided I had had enough of television. I was pigeonholed. I went for a job called Couch Time, which was on Channel 11, right? And I didn't get it because I was too kids TV. And I thought, right, I've got to break this mold. So I was like, oh, man, I want to get out of TV. I want to get out of kids TV. And I had, I just did ads, ads for this company in Adelaide. So I had so much money in the bank and it was either go overseas on my own, go back to Brisbane and start fresh or move to Melbourne and have a crack at radio. And I had a girlfriend at the time and which was one of the reasons why I didn't go overseas. And it would just, I called my friend who lived in Melbourne and he said, I've got a spare room. I said, done. I'll be there in a month. Yeah. And I quit. And, and you, didn't, you didn't have to enter that room through a crack in the wall? No. It, it was, was a fully walled wall? Oh, it was such a good house. <laughs> such a cool was. unit, man. <laughs> yeah, that, no, that was really good. And so, yeah, I decided I've had enough of TV. I've had enough of kids TV and being pigeonholed. I, I'm bored. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try radio because I really like it. And so I moved there and I got a job with Nova in, at, in Melbourne, Nova 100, and I was the promo boy driving the cars and I had to weasel my way into that studio on weekends, out of hours, and I had to just beg them to teach me, beg them to let me play on the studio. And, yeah, I did that for about eight, nine months until I got an opportunity to demo for here in Albury and I got it, which was really, really exciting. Yeah, that is. And when you're going through that process at Nova, because it kind of feels like it's an alien world, that radio world, mm. that it's for, well, traditionally it's for comedians and people that are born to it, mm. like that have the voice of a, a jock. Yeah. Well, you're one of the funniest people or you've got a huge stand-up career. Yeah. How hard was it to get them to give you time oh, man. as someone that wasn't coming from that pedigree oh. of I'm – you know, I'm not, you know, a Will Anderson or a Dave yeah. Hughes or a Marty Shegold where, yeah. you know, they're funny people and they're known for it. Mate, it was pulling. It was really difficult and I really, I was so down. I got down. I really struggled with, um, I really struggled because I, I was I was basically unemployed because I was getting paid so poorly as a promo dude and no hours and no one was replying to emails and no one was replying to me and, and, and I literally... I got into trouble so many times because 
I was literally walking into offices and saying, hey, have you got a sec? I want to talk to you. I really want to get in the studio. I really want to do this. I really want to do this. And, you know, man, I got so many doors shut in my face because exactly I had no skills, none. Yeah, sure, I was on TV for a couple of years, but that had no benefit to them. No one wanted to really train me except one dude did. His name's Benny Herbsland and he does – um. Uh, he's in Nova in Sydney and he was great. I, he taught me everything. He was really, really good. And he kind of took me under his wing. And, but that took so long. And then, um, funny Adelaide reared its head again and they offered me a job to do casual weekend shifts on air. And I was like, this is amazing. That's so, obviously back in Adelaide. Back in Adelaide. Yeah. And I was like, great. And so they said, Hey, Adelaide said to Melbourne, you need to give him more shifts because he's not ready yet. And so they, I all of a sudden I went from not on air to on air from 12 a.m. to 4 a.m. Uh, in Melbourne on on Nova on my own, and then um, and then I did a two week stint during workday in Adelaide from nine till one. On my own. And man, did I stuff up so well, many times. <laughs> that included running the panel? Yeah, I did everything. I was what? a solo work music announcer, which um, which I can't believe I, I freaking convinced them to give me that job. Yeah, but to be honest, you've got more personality in your current mustache than nose pain <laughs> than a lot of those workday announcers do. I mean, you're obviously, you're too tall and you don't have big enough hair. So yeah. I was surprised you got the job. <laughs> Yeah, I know. And well, the funny thing is that they, Adelaide, Nova Adelaide hate me because I was two timing them the whole time I was in negotiations with HIT and HIT here in Albury. And then they offered me a job for January starting the new year, right? This is 2017. This was 2017. January 2017, I meant to start five days before I meant to be there. I called him and I said, I'm sorry. I've got a job in Albury and breakfast for HIT. (laughs) Oh, man. (laughs) I was not a liked person no. in all of radio, eh? Yeah. But they've gotten over it. Yeah, very good. So let's jump forward. You're obviously now part of the local community here in Albury. Mm-hmm. And I think from your last survey, you're on the most listened to radio yeah. station. So obviously you're a big part of people's mornings. We so. are number two station, number one breakfast show, which yeah, is right cool. Right. Which right Yeah, right. which is awesome. So obviously your job is now to help people get through the morning around here. Yeah. What is it, again, about Albury that – was there anything unexpected about this town? Because you seem to have embraced it, not in that – I'll use an example of someone that I I listened mm-hmm. to because I thought that that was a sign of a mid-level talent and mm-hmm. it's a guy named Ryan John and I think he was doing Brisbane – no, I think he might have been in Canberra. Yes, and I, went I know and, exactly I, who you're talking about. I went and listened to him a lot and he seems like a talented, funny guy but it seemed like there was a lot of artifice mm-hmm. in his personality mm-hmm. and maybe that's just got him old. Mm. And I just am oversensitive to when I think people are bullshitting. But you seem to genuinely like this place. I do. What were you expecting? To, obviously coming from Brisbane, which is every photo you ever see of Brisbane is basically <laughs> like it's a postcard. You went to Adelaide, yeah. which is this old historical place, and then Melbourne, which is the most livable city yeah. in the world pretty much. I mean, I lived in Melbourne. I loved it. And then you come to Albury. Yeah. How, how have you found well, this area in general. This is my mantra here. I've lived Brisbane, Adelaide, Melbourne, right? One of the most unhappy I've ever been was in Melbourne, Adelaide and Brisbane, right? But the most happiest I've been is here in Albury. I just have this mindset of it's not where you live, it's how you live. And this is what I've learned from wanting to leave Brisbane and then moving to Adelaide because I thought the grass was greener and then leaving Adelaide because I thought the grass was greener and then getting to Melbourne, which is the most livable city in the world, one of the best cities in the world, one of the most opportunities, yet I was miserable, absolutely miserable because mm, I just, you know, I was just struggling with so many things. And I think this is why I like Albury. It's three hours from Melbourne, which is one of the greatest cities in the world. The river... Murray River is one of the most beautiful things ever and I miss that of Brisbane because the Brisbane River is amazing even though it looks so dirty and full of sewage. Yeah. <laughs> but the Murray River is just so natural, untouched and really nice to be around and it still has a really livable place. You can you can live here for so cheap and have a great lifestyle here whereas you can't actually have this in Melbourne. You're, you're paying through the roof rent and you're driving 
hours sometimes to get to and from work. Here, mate, it takes me one song to get to work. From my door to the work door, one song. Yeah. I think I've got to cross the border and I think it takes me under 10 minutes yeah, to get to the third story of my car park where I work. Exactly. And, and that's, that's just as long just going through the car park yeah. as the rest of the drive. <laughs> Seven minutes is in the car park. Alone. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think now, I mean, I haven't lived everywhere. I've lived in four places, but I think I could live ever, anywhere because I've changed my mindset. It's not where you live, it's how you live. And if you can nail that, I think you can have a pretty sustainable lifestyle. I yeah, think. that's great. So it's probably about time to wind it up. I just mm. wanted to tell you a little story mm-hmm. and I'll see how you feel about this as someone that spends a lot of time with your co-host, Riley. Yeah. And we're from the same town, yes. I told. I don't know whether Seamus knew that before he came here today, but I grew up in Koryong also. And it's funny that you mentioned the river mm. because to me, when I moved back from Albury, mm-hmm. I'm sorry, moved back from Melbourne to Albury, mm-hmm. Even though I'm not one of these people that goes to the river, just knowing that it's there reminds me of when I lived in Corion. Mm-hmm. Because the river was probably back when I was riding a push bike. <laughs> it was about, I lived a little bit out of town towards the river, and then the river would have been 20 minutes away by a push bike. Yeah. It's about 10 minutes in a car or whatever. And it's really weird to say, but now that it's someone else who feels that way, mm. you felt that because of your connection to Brisbane and the river. It's really strange how things that are just natural parts of the world can kind of ground you in a place. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just weird that I came up. Yeah. Well, I looked at the Murray River one day when I just moved here and I looked at it and I was like, man, I think this, what I'm looking at right now, this scenery probably hasn't changed in hundreds of years. Like, Everything looked so natural. I mean, I'm sure maybe the council have done a few things here and there, but yeah. it just looked it looked like I could have been in a time capsule and it could have been, you know, hundreds of years old and it's completely untouched. And that Murray River is like a, a an elect, like an electric current of life injected through the whole town. Yeah, it and is. And yeah, I don't know. I just I just I just really like it. I think it's yeah. nice. The the summers here are too hot for me. They're pretty warm. So I, I don't think that as I get old and less tolerant of the heat, it happens every year. Yeah. Every year I think, oh, that's got to be the worst. The next year I'm like, shit. <laughs> so freaking This is peaking. I know. So I'll probably, I think I'm actually part Canadian, so I'll probably end up <laughs> moving overseas. But yeah. I don't think Albury would be as special without the river. Totally. It's what separates this town from other, you know, towns of similar size. Yeah, totally. No, I, I definitely think there's an energy about it. Which is, you know, responsible by the river, I feel. Yeah. Like, now that I've given up booze, one thing I'm really excited about is getting up early on a Sunday or a Saturday and running along the Murray. Yeah. It's just, yeah, it's, I, I just really like it. I think it's good. You're not going to know yourself, mate. <laughs> I know. You'll actually get to some proper good, good quality <laughs> sleep and then get to get up when you actually want to. I know. It's going to be glorious. Excellent. Well, thank you, Seamus. It's been a real pleasure. And mate. hopefully we can hang out at some other point because you are a very funny man. Well, mate, I really appreciate you having me. Thank you so much. And if there's anyone out there that's listening to this and thinks Seamus should have his own podcast, <laughs> I can probably help him out with a few episodes. So make sure you tweet him, what's the, Facebook him, what's uh, the best way to I do I think it? Instagram now is the best way to do yeah. things. Twitter, I just, mean, unless you're a celebrity, no one uses Twitter. Just direct message the F out of him on yeah. Instagram yeah. and yeah. just tell him to start a podcast because I think it'd be pretty funny. I wanted, I'd like to hear more of those day-to-day stories from the TV shows, what you were doing away from oh, the, man. away from the set. <laughs> I know we're finishing up, but, geez, that was loose. Like, I'll just finish on one. I'm down like, for it. <laughs> oh, I used to date multiple journalists and makeup artists at Channel 10 in Brisbane at the same time. Well, that's very Kyle Sanderlands of you. <laughs> I know. I couldn't believe I was getting away with it. And I remember I'd, I'd be finishing winding down at about 3.30 in the afternoon and I'd send them messages or emails saying, want to meet me downstairs in the Tosa TV studio? <laughs> and I would meet them. We'd come down at different times and we'd make out behind the set. Oh, man, it was so cool. <laughs> and then, yeah, and then... and then and Nothing more romantic than the name <laughs> Toasted <laughs> TV. Behind a crummy cardboard set. <laughs> yeah. <it's>, come <laughs> here, baby. Come on. Right on, mate. Thank you very much. Thanks, bud. Thanks, bud.